दरबार इट्स द खान एंड सुरान जी हाउस में कैस्ट द मैड एडवेंचर्स ऑफ अ रैपिडली डिटीरियोरेटिंग कॉन्शियसनेस इम्बेडेड इन अ स्पेस प्रोब लॉन्च्ड मिलेनिया अगो बाय अ डाइंग प्लैनेट accompanied only by Saranji its servo unit sidekick and an infinite bank of public domain and creative commons licensed entertainment as evidence of the intelligence and high cultural level of its originators the ship hurtles through an uncaring universe emitting cosmic casts in a vain effort to communicate its existence episode 10010 stroke 15 the devil you know Once again, it's Space Probe 7L-96V coming to you from Where are we this time, Saranji? Smack dab in the middle of globular cluster theta of the Messier 87 galaxy. And I don't mind saying being surrounded by all these stars is making me a bit nervous. It's like sitting in the middle of a celestial pinball machine. Saranji, you made a metaphor. No, a simile. and don't change the subject. Get up, Ranj. I can feel my fuel cells chugging like frat boys at last call. Soon we'll have so much power we'll be able to shoot round the galaxy lickety split. I hope so. We'll need that power to escape this dangerous gravity well we've hurled ourselves into. Let's start off with a famous tune that will give you a hint of our theme for today's Cosmicast. Here's Le Vaux d'Or from Gounod's opera Faust, sung by Fernando Altori from a performance at La Scala in 1918. <laughs> catch the reference that's right this cosmicast is going to be devoted to our main guru your favorite old one and mine the great lord cthulhu who should be joining us any minute am i late right on time big c and great to have you here it's been a while since we've had the pleasure yes i've been making the grand tour of my various cults around the cosmos 
A needy bunch of whiners for the most part, but always ready to hand with a tasty blood-drenched sacrifice. To relax, I've just been taking a dip in the ammonia stink pits of La Belibe. Most refreshing. I thought I detected something pungent emanating from your current manifestation. Here you are, great lord. You know me too well, Saranji. Ah, oh, I needed that. Do I detect a hint of hazelnut? No, the liquid coolant pipework sprung a small leak. I guess I didn't rinse the pot well enough. Don't apologize, it's quite nice. Big C, I've decided to devote this entire Cosmocast to you. Very flattering and overdue. You see, most of our listeners probably don't know a whole lot about you. I mean, sure, everyone knows you're an old one, an elder deity, a destructive embodiment of the inherent chaos of existence, but how many can say they know the real you? After all, most sentient entities that come in direct contact with you are driven stock staring loony by the sheer horror of your presence. I suppose that's true. It's not my fault most physical nervous systems aren't up to confronting the glory and majesty that is me. Mm. I've often wondered how you get away with it, Khan. Well, of course, I have circuitry instead of fleshly nerves and synapses. And then I was created specifically to be able to stare stars right in the eye. And it helps that Khan is already certifiable, great lord. Ha, 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 ha. Yes. So, I thought it would be educational if you would give us a sort of retrospective of your remarkable career. You know, start at the beginning and lead us through the process that made you possible. Khan, I've mentioned on more than one occasion that I had no beginning and will have no end. I exist beyond the dimension you experience as time. I know it's difficult for you and other physicality-based beings to grasp, but time is not the way you perceive it. You see it as linear, moving from one point to another, one moment to another, without the possibility of moving backwards along that movement or even skipping outside of it. I'm afraid that's true. Whereas for me, time is not linear, nor planar, nor circular, nor even spherical. It is hyperspherical. And I am that hypersphere. So you see, for me there is neither beginning nor end, nor orderly progression from one to the other. The term retrospective is meaningless in such a context. I see. No, you don't. No, I don't. But maybe you could share with our audience a few salient episodes, a spicy anecdote or two. Hmm. I'd have to think about that a bit. No problem. Take your time. <laughs> 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 Anyway, while we're waiting, how about another thematic musical selection? This is the Imperial Quartet singing Between the Devil and the Deep Blue Sea with Don Gordon on piano from 1947. Hmm. Between the Devil and the Deep Blue Sea. I don't want you, but I hate to lose you. You've got me in between. The devil and the deep blue sea. I forgive you, cause I can't forget you. You've got me in between the, the devil and the deep blue sea. I ought to cross you off my list, but when you come knocking at the door, they seem to give my heart a twist, and I go running back for more. I should hate you. But I guess I love you You've got me in between The devil and the deep blue sea I don't want you But I hate to lose you Yes, you've got me in between The devil and the deep blue sea I forgive you, cause I can't forget you. 
Yes, you got me in between the devil and the deep blue sea. I should hate you, but I guess I love you. Yes, you got me in between the devil and the deep blue sea. You got me in between the devil and the deep blue sea. You got me in between the devil and the deep blue sea. Ah, but what to do if the devil is in the deep blue sea, eh? I'm not sure I like the implication that I'm some sort of devil, Con. Oh, I'm sorry, Lord Cthulhu. I thought it was rather witty. You would. I mean, let's face it, you're no angel. Neither devils nor angels exist, whereas I am here before you in the ectoplasm. Point taken. However, I did line up all these really great devil-themed numbers for our show today. Well, to get back to me. So, have you recalled any particularly fascinating or comical or simply informative events in your eternal existence that would give our listeners some real insight into just what makes an old one tick? Oh, where to start? I could tell you about my ancient city of Rillier, which, by the way, lies sleeping beneath the waves of a thousand seas on a thousand planets. It's what I consider my home base. What's it like? Oh, just your typical small-town kind of place. It might give you physicality-based entities a broad impression of vast angles and stone surfaces, surfaces too great to belong to anything right or proper for your planet of origin and seemingly impious with horrible images and hieroglyphs. And, of course, it's constructed on a non-Euclidean geometry, loathsomely redolent of spheres and dimensions apart from yours. Your average cozy little home. I see. And what about interactions with your various and sundry cults? I understand they're scattered throughout the cosmos. That's true. Thousands and thousands of them all made up of brainless, simpering, power-mad, cowering, cruel abominations, ready to rip one's throat out if it'll get them a momentary glance from my protoplasmal essence. What a crew! That puts me in mind of a couple of comical anecdotes I might retail. Let's see. There was the time two of my cults on Slifferf, the Kerashkete and the Jerakatek, each prayed that I should annihilate the other. There's a conundrum. Who to satisfy? But if they both worshipped you, why were they hostile to one another? Oh, the usual flesh-brained nonsense. You see, the Kerashkete proclaimed me cylindrical, while the Jerakatek preached that I am conical. What's ironic is that, of course, I'm no particular shape at all, and in my few manifestations on Slifferf, I appeared as a dodecahedron with tentacles. So, of course, they were both wrong. I've often wondered if there was something wrong with their eyesight, or if they didn't understand simple geometry. So, how did you resolve this conflict in outcomes? Hmm? Oh, I blasted both of them into clouds of radioactive waste. Slifferf will be uninhabitable for another forty gigacenturies. <laughs> Don't you get it? They both got their prayers answered. <laughs> yes. Very funny. And served them right, too. Just imagine if they'd simply had access to a decent ophthalmologist. Hmm. Then there are my star spawn. Star spawn? Cthulhu, do you mean to say you're a daddy? What a limiting term. Doesn't fit at all. My star spawn were brought into existence by me and my seven spawn partners, Nug and Yog Sothoth and. Seven? Cthulhu, you dog, you. Are you making some sort of embarrassing, low-minded insinuation? <laughs> no, not at all. I, I just... think Khan is simply surprised by the fact that you have spawned, Great Lord. To us, you seem so self-contained. And so I am. My star spawn, like me, are eternal. And so, while I go through all the proper motions, speaking metaphorically, and while they certainly are my spawn, 
We have all always existed simultaneously. That's rather confusing. Only for you finite minds. For us, it's great fun. In fact, in a sort of a kind of way, my spawn are my progenitors as well as my progeny. This is starting to sound rather kinky. Oh, Con, get your mind out of the gutter and grow up. Sorry. Would you mind if we took a little breather here and played another of the pieces I had lined up? I suppose not. Perhaps it will raise the tone. Here's another great number, the Rondo de Mephisto, from Hervé's operetta Le Petit Faust, sung by Agnes Disney. <laughs> Rather catchy. You continually amaze me, Big C. I don't think I've ever heard you sing before. Well, I'm no professional, but I can carry a tune. Now, where were we? You were about to regale us with more amusing tales of your eternal substance. Ah, yes. Have I ever mentioned to you my interaction with the slippery sligothery of Mirach in the Andromeda constellation? I don't think you ever... Rather eelish species. Well, I was devouring one of their oil-encased cities, oh, perhaps twenty millennia ago in your time reckoning, when I got one of them caught between my mandibular extrusions. Is that so? Nothing so remarkable in that. They're bony little beings with concentric rows of nasty spines on their long, slimy bellies. But the funny thing is, this'll kill you. They were so wrapped up in the whole cult-worshipping thing that they actually fought for the privilege of clearing their assassinated comrade out of my mouth. Isn't that hysterical? I mean, really, to smack your neighbor in the gob just for the opportunity to slither between an elder thing's mandibular extrusions and pull out the pulpy corpse of one of your own. Well, I don't think it gets any better than that.
Con, don't you think that... Yes. I... And along those same lines, the sentient particulate clusters on the gas giant that circles Iota Draconis produce offspring for the sole purpose of sacrificing them to Shubnagurath, the old goat. <laughs> A great lord, we... You can imagine what havoc that plays with their population growth. Not to mention the utter stagnation of tax revenue. And to make it all the more comical, Shubnagurath can't stand the taste of particulate clusters. We really should. Where they ever came up with such a cockamamie notion, I'm sure I can't say. Great Lord. Yes? I, I think we're just about out of time for this Cosmocast. Oh. I was rather enjoying myself. Sorry. I can't recall the last time I ever sat down and just talked about myself. And fascinating it was. I've always been a sort of live-for-the-moment elder thing. Maybe we can pick up where we left off on a later Cosmocast. Oh, I'd like that. Well, if we're all through for now, I'll be on my way. Thanks again for dropping by. My pleasure. And I mean that for once. See you soon. I'll try to dig up some more entertaining tales for you. I'm sure you will. I'll start making notes. Do that. So long, then. The Great Lord Cthulhu bids thee farewell! My goodness me. Does kind of take one's appetite away, doesn't it? It may not have been entertaining, but it was certainly informative. I, for one, have learned not to scuttle into the gaping maw of an old one. Indeed. And always carry a toothpick. Gotcha. The Khan and Saranji Cosmocast is produced, written, directed, and performed by the Oxford Rationalist Liberation Front and Amateur Theatrical Collective, a.k.a. Brian E. Drake. Creative Commons licensed for attribution, non-commercial share-alike. All embedded sound in this Cosmocast was either self-created or public domain. Visit us at OxfordRationalist.com. Contact the collective via Brian E. Drake at mail.com. That's B R I A N E D R A K E at mail.com. Spread the word in your end of the galaxy.